I am so excited to have this conversation and share it with you. It's a conversation with Hayley Wall um, on our Living With series. Thank you for joining us. Uh, let me give you a little bit of background about Hayley before we dig into the conversation with her. She is an entry-level certified occupational therapist who is always sleepy. Hayley enjoys adventuring with her dog, more of that to follow. She also enjoys reading and being surrounded by family and friends. Support comes into this conversation also. And she's also an advocate for self-care whenever she can. Hayley's medical journey began when she was eight years old and she was told at that point for years that her sleepiness was due to other health conditions. Up until 2017 when Hayley received a diagnosis of idiopathic hypersomnia. Now as she steps into the world of advocacy, Hayley has a passion to spread awareness about IH, to share her journey and has a vision with the hope to expand the field of occupational therapy as a supportive IH treatment to help others improve their quality of life and overall well-being. So join me in welcoming Hayley. I hope you enjoy this episode. There's, it's very rich. There's lots to dig into. So thank you for joining us and welcome Hayley. Hello and um, welcome Hayley to Living With. I am so delighted today to have a few minutes with you. I know we've connected before. You're an advocate in the hypersomnia space. Um, you're a person living with IH and you very kindly agreed to share your journey with us and insights that you have specifically about being um, also an occupational therapist. So thank you so much for joining us. Can we start, can you take us back actually, maybe even pre-diagnosis? Sure. Um... So I've had a little bit more of a complex medical history outside of IH. Uh, and when I was eight years old, I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. And with that came a lot of challenges, an entire lifestyle change. Um, being so young, I did also feel I had to not just rely on my parents a lot, but grow up really, really fast. Um, which essentially when I reflect on it now, I do feel that it was a benefit to me in my position today. And so kind of growing up, I might make sure my blood sugars were managed. Um, it was all challenging. I was on shots and then I transferred over to an insulin pump. So mm -hmm. there was a whole bunch of things. And then I started ex experiencing some tiredness. And uh, I was just told, you know, it's your diabetes. You know, your yeah. blood sugars aren't in the best control. So that's what it was attributed to. And then a couple of years down the line, it was, oh, this tiredness is from your depression and anxiety. And I had no reason to not believe them. So I, I believe them. Um, which kind of brings me right to 2017 in my diagnosis of IH. Um, I would say my most significant memories of that overwhelming sleepiness is when I started my freshman year of college and I was really struggling, uh, mm -hmm. trying to stay awake and getting through class. Um, I had a roommate my first year of school and it was a random, so I didn't know her. She now is still one of my closest friends. Um, but she would describe to me, like, I, I tried to wake you up out of this, like, rock state. And she would shake me and um, just all these crazy things to try to wake me up. And it was, I was like, this this isn't normal. Was that quite helpful then, Haley? sort of having someone that you were literally living in the same space as and their sort of, their sleep is, quote, normal. Was was that helpful? I would say so, yes. Um we quickly became friends, so it was kind of a built-in um, sister for me. And she she was going to school to be a nurse. I was doing my undergrad in like a pre-occupational therapy route, so she had a lot of that medical more knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, but when we were just starting out, we were both like, "Yeah, this isn't really that normal." Um, so I I ended up getting into a sleep study through Boston Children's. I did the overnight and then the daytime naps, um, which showed my uh, 
overnight sleep was completely normal, but mm. I was had a mean latency of uh, just about four and a half minutes for falling asleep in every nap. And I mm. received my IH diagnosis. diagnosis. So how long was that timeline sort of what you would identify as onset of IH symptoms to diagnosis? Give us a timeline there, Haley. I would say because I was told, you know, growing up from eight years old until I was 18, so 10 years, that all of this exhaustion was related to other other things. I'm not 1000% positive it was IH symptoms then, um, but I would say when I really, really started struggling, it was about a year and a half or two years mm-hmm. to get that mm-hmm. that sleep study in um, and finally get right. that diagnosis. Yeah, this is a question sort of we hear a lot that people might want to know, but do you know why you developed IH? I do not. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, I kind of was excited to get a diagnosis finally. And uh, as as most of us know, that reality is not very exciting. Right. <laughs> it's we right. have no idea why. Right. And I mention it also because that's that word, isn't it? Idiopathic. Um, idiopathic hypersomnia, which just means we just don't know the cause and it's not a helpful term. And I think that still is really prevalent in on a lot of people's minds, you know, why the big why? Why did I get it? What was the reasoning there? So um, how did that look then through college? Did you receive treatment in your freshman year? I did. So I started off with um, stimulants. And the first one I tried, I was allergic to. So I had to quickly get off that and do a new one. Oh my gosh. Um, I would say I my, my memory is a little foggy through that time frame just because I think I was so overly sleepy and tired and all mm-hmm. the, the effects and symptoms from the brain fog. And um, so I actually had asked my roommate recently, like, what, what did you notice after I w- got that diagnosis and it was before I was medicated versus after? And she said, you know, I really realized you were more present. Not that you weren't present always, but it was a little more noticeable when we were having a conversation, you kind of would space out a little bit more or five seconds after you said something, I would reply and you'd be asleep like that. Mm. Um, so that's the stimulants definitely helped me be more present in the moment right. and engaged. And you mentioned brain fog. That's um, also extremely common and really frustrating and um, disabling in many ways for people. What's, what's, how would you describe your brain fog and the, its impact on your life? I, I honestly would say my brain fog and the cognitive deficits are one of the most challenging pieces of IH. Um, yes, that excessive sleepiness every day is hard, but trying to, first of all, get through schooling mm-hmm. with this like cloud, it feels some, like my head is in a cloud. Um, I can't think straight. Sometimes it is incredibly hard to focus. Um, and when you're trying to do well in school, you, as you can imagine, it is, it's very frustrating. Um, yeah, I just, it, it truly just feels like my head is in a cloud and I just, all of my brain function kind of just goes, mm-hmm. and that's not, it doesn't happen all the time, but there are points that it gets really uh, debilitating. Right. How did that impact your sort of studies and did you then need accommodations? Yes. So in undergrad, I did not have accommodations. I think I was learning what IH was. I was kind of figuring out myself. Um, My undergrad, I was able to do actually really well in, and I don't know if that's because I had just started being medicated and my body was like, wow, this is, this is great. Um, but that transition into grad school was significantly difficult. Um, a much more rigorous course load, a lot Mm. more cognitive demand and, um, I mean, because it's quite physically engaging, isn't it? OT. So were there any, Mm. did you have any sort of physical challenges as well around, 
Um, I mean, yeah, how, what did that look like, sort of being on your feet as well, probably at the latter end of your course and um, needing naps and then the brain fog layered up as well because you've also, it's an academic, it's a very academic course. I would say physically, the physical demands of my field work were a little bit more challenging than the actual lecture semesters. Mm -hmm. Uh, the way that my school ran was it was uh, summer, fall, spring, summer of lecture. And then the last fall, spring was our fieldwork rotations. Um, for for my lecture semesters, I did have accommodations um, okay. where I was allowed to have um, drinks and food, which everybody was. But just in, in the case that it was in a situation where I couldn't, I had that accommodation. Um, I was able to get up and walk out of the class, no questions asked, um, which I had to do quite a few times just to like recollect myself sitting in yeah. one place for a long extended period of time is not good for anyone, but especially right. when you're already right. excessively sleepy Sleeping. during the day. Yeah. Um, yeah. I also was, was using standing desks at the back of the class so that I like, could just change position and you know, standing kind of requires a little bit more stimulation to the body. Right. Uh, using one of those uh, yoga balls as oh, a yeah. chair instead to kind of have that movement. Um, all things that are kind of already OT things. So it right. wasn't out of the ordinary in my classroom setting. But right. if it weren't OT, it definitely would be something I don't think most would would recognize or know know to ask. Right. So you didn't have accommodations for for sleeping, for naps? I did not. Um, the Whenever I take, I, I try to avoid naps, really. I Whenever I get those overwhelming, um, the word that I see most commonly is sleep attacks, where mm -hmm. it's just impossible if I were to try to push, um, I will have to lay down and take a nap. Um, but I did also actually have permission to have my car in the lot close to campus. So if I needed to go sit in my car to nap, I could. Um, I never did actually nap in my car, but there were quite a few times just from being overstimulated and overwhelmed that I did have to go sit in my car and just have lunch. Um, and then for, for brain fog things, uh, my short-term memory and recall is not the best. Um, and so they had this pen device that actually would record the lectures and I could upload them to my laptop. So as the lecture was happening, I could record what was happening as I'm writing my notes. And if I missed something, I was then able to go back later that evening and re-listen to it. And that's something that really helped me succeed, right. I believe, um, yeah. in my courses. Right. We've come across that quite a bit, that sort of recorded scribe. And um, can you share a little bit more about that? Like what, what's the main, you know, which one did you find most helpful? Because I am I think probably quite a few people listening to this might want a bit more information about that because it is something we can you can just purchase without a prescription or anything like that, isn't it? Absolutely. They So my school provided me one. I, I don't remember what brand it was. Um but there's an app that I use personally in my like daily life called Notability. Um, I believe it's free, and that also has a recording function. And like you can wow. be writing notes, and it will record to that specific line of notes you're taking. So if you were to replay it, it would kind of highlight that piece. That's um, awesome. And I kind of found that later in the game, but mm -hmm. uh, that is something that. If I were to, you know, go do something again now, I'm finished with school, but that's yeah. something I would definitely use. Okay. That's amazing. So, um, so you got through school. Congratulations on being a qualified OT. I want to dig into that uh, in a moment Thank because you. I know you've got some really good ideas about how OT as a profession can kind of intersect with um, idiopathic hypersomnia in the whole field of sleep. But um, just staying with you for a minute there, Haley. how how else do you feel that having idiopathic hypersomnia has impacted your life? I think in every single way anyone could possibly think of. Um, 
relationships, uh, definitely mental health, feeling mm-hmm. extremely lonely a lot of the times, um, definitely physical health. I definitely like, trying to exercise, um, go to the gym like a quote unquote normal person would do. That's that's usually not an option for me at the end of the day or in the morning because then my whole entire day is just not not going to go well. Um, but I think I think the relationship pieces, having to say no to things when I do want to go, but it's either not safe to drive or um, I just simply do not have that physical or mental energy to to do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that's been one of the really hardest pieces of all of it. Right, right. Thank you for sharing that. So. Um... You know, I think we met because you also have kind of turned a lot of these real challenges and, you know, what ordinarily would look like really negative aspects of daily life into something positive um, and actually kind of on with your own, on your own volition, as it were, come through this season of your life and come out as an advocate. Um mm-hmm. Can you say a little bit more about what that looks like and why you felt it was um, really important that you pursue advocacy as a person living with idiopathic hypersomnia? Absolutely. I um, through when I was going through grad school, and I kind of had in the back of my head, huh, like, is there is OT in sleep disorders? Um, in in the rigorous program, I really didn't have much time to go dive deeper into it um, until I was in field work and I brought it up to one of my field work um, educators. And, you know, she was like, that's actually like, I don't know, you should look into that. And so after I um, passed my exam, my certification exam, I dove in and I was like, what is out there? What can I get into? Um, and in terms of a general person with a sleep disorder, there really wasn't much out there other than research saying, you know, this could be beneficial, but there's not anything Mm -hmm. stating that it is yet. Um, And so I kind of, as a person living with IH was, was like, how, how is this possible? You know, I have just learned so many things in school as an OT that I use that helped me another person who doesn't even know what OT is will have no idea about right. these different techniques. Um, and all these techniques are proven to work for different conditions as well, like autism or sensory processing disorder or all of those things. They are proven as effective evidence-based treatments, but there's nothing there for sleep disorders. So because I've lived through these challenges of my life and kind of come out at the end of schooling, feeling like I have a good grip on managing my symptoms, I feel really strongly to advocate for awareness because first of all, IH is not, it's not a common condition. It's rare. Um, allow other people's voices to be heard, help people get through with advocacy of their, in, in their own body. Um, but also advocate for the profession of OT in in sleep disorders because I do believe it would be a really beneficial yeah. piece of specialty to get into. Yeah. Can you share some of the real specifics about that? Because you've said that, you know, it's been proven in other areas of um, medicine that specific o- OT techniques work. What ones do you think, as someone who is both an OT and has IH, where do you think that intersection could could potentially be explored? I think, so I've done a lot of work in school systems as well. So I was really exposed to um, the executive functioning pieces and a lot of sensory processing um, treatments for kiddos who have autism or ADHD, you know, just dis- dysregulation of sensory mm-hmm. needs in the body, which kind of present as either behaviors or um, just either being sluggish or way too overstimulated in an environment. So there are techniques that are used uh, to help them regulate their bodies and feel more calm, um, or if they're feeling more sluggish and, and slower and less alert, 
there are more stimulating activities. So there are, um, there's this thing called a sensory diet that was developed by occupational therapists. And it essentially is an individualized plan for a person of physical activities and accommodations. Mm -hmm. So you have all of the sensory systems, you know, the auditory, taste, proprioception, um, vestibular. There's, I believe, eight in total. And there's activities that someone can perform in each and every single one of those to help regulate those sensory needs. Um, where I really saw this help me was for feeling to, or trying those activities to help my alertness levels because mm-hmm. my alert, I was just, you know, I really needed that pick me up. And so, you know, in my everyday life now, I don't really sit longer than 25 to 30 minutes at a time. I get up and I move around, whether it's just walking around the space I'm in or, you know, standing and rocking back and forth. Rocking mm-hmm. side to side, something to just wake up, move my body. Um, and another really important one is is in the car because I know a lot of people with IH have either some concerns or have had safety um, issues with driving in, in accidents. And so that is something I've been extremely cautious of through my whole journey with mm-hmm. IH and using the taste sensory system and having crunchy foods with me at, right. when I'm doing long periods of driving just to have that extra piece of crunchiness. Mm-hmm. And it's, mm-hmm. um, you know, just more stimulating to my brain. And instead of just sitting there and doing nothing and have right. being way more likely to doze off. Right. Um, right. Those That's are really all smart. pieces that I do. But again, people who don't know what that is mm-hmm. wouldn't, wouldn't know to even try that. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's not necessarily a diet of food. It's, it's just a, a term used to, to describe an individualized yeah. plan, which is what OTs do. We individualize mm-hmm. each and every treatment for every, every person that we work with. Right. Um, Lo- because we all different... also don't experience IH the same. Right. That's <laughs> That's such an important um, piece there to have so many different tools in your toolbox. Now, um, with that, is does that inform a lot of your work on social media? Let's let's talk about you as an advocate as well, Haley, and the the kind of the direction, the sort of niche, as it were, that you have as a person with IH and um, the UROT um, background, um, but also what kind of platforms can people find you on? Where do you feel like, is it video content? What is it that you do where um, you're really seeking to educate people? Sure. So I actually just kind of started this social media journey. Um, It is something that's kind of typically out of my realm, but I am really excited to be getting into it. Um, I am posting more videos right now in the beginning um, on Instagram and TikTok as the Sleepy OT. And um, as I kind of keep getting into it and, um, you know, gain more of a following, I do hope to turn it less from here's kind of my story and of course, I'm going to always in- involve education and advocacy on a, on a bigger realm. But I do hope to make videos in the re- very near future about all of these things that I'm trying um, to see if, you know, it's not I can't medically or, or I can't make these individualized treatments for people in my position right now. Um, I think that's where my vision and mission of, you know, really trying to get out there and, and into the um, OT field with, with all this information of sleep disorders yeah. to be able to have that provided for people yeah. like, like me. Yeah. I think I first, um, found you with your dog actually on, it might've been Instagram or TikTok, <laughs> but can you speak? And I was, you said a word that was really, um, resonated with, with me as a caregiver to, to Matilda. Of course she has narcolepsy, but, um, you said that having a dog obligated you to walk. And I thought that was really impressive because perhaps when you're so tired and so sleepy and so debilitated that 
it's hard to even make that step to get, say, a, say something like a dog that will make you obligated because then you have to do it. You have to walk the dog. Right. Uh, what, what role has your dog had in your sort of well-being? He is my best Look at your friend. smile. <laughs> yeah, I love um, your smile. He truly, I, I, it was the best decision I ever made. And again, yeah. that's for my own personal life. I don't recommend just anyone going out to get a dog to help them be more active. But um, growing up, dogs, I loved dogs. And I've always wanted a dog of my own. And so actually, when I graduated from my undergrad, I adopted Ryder with the intention of, you know, I also tend to really throw myself just into schoolwork and mm -hmm. ignore everything else and not take care of my my own needs and, and well-being as much. Um, so I'm left at the end of the day feeling exhausted and mm -hmm. so depleted of energy and I just go to bed. So right. my intention with adopting him was, you know, I can't do that. If I have something else that I'm obligated to take care of, it's another life. I will have to kind of take a break, take a step back, take a walk, regardless of how tired I am, regardless if it's it's a five minute mm -hmm. or one hour or walk. It does like, you know, um he he's truly been the one of the biggest blessings in my life. Um and I also knew I have a really great support system of tight knit friends, um, my fiance, my parents, mm -hmm. uh, my mom actually. In my grandmother watch watch Ryder for me all the time um, if I'm traveling. But if I if I needed help, I knew I had it, and I think that's another right. big piece of it. Okay. It wasn't I'm stranded if I can't, right. but it really right. does give me that extra like, come on, you got to bring you got to bring Ryder out. You got to go for a walk, even if you don't want to. Yeah. So what what role do you think the social support um, has kind of provided in your journey with IH? I will say, I think if I did not have it, I would not be in this position. Mm -hmm. um, I have a, a small, it's a very, it's small, but they're all quality. It's, mm -hmm. it's, for me, it's less quantity. It's very much quality for my friendships yeah. because, you know, it is, it is difficult to try to explain to a bunch of people, yeah. you know, I can't go do that tonight or, mm -hmm. you know, I don't want to let you down. Um, so with friendships, I think it's essential to find those people in your life. Um, my parents, my mom has been a, was has always been a strong advocate for me. Um, I have a really really great relationship with her, my sister, my brother, um, my dad, and my grandparents. You know, they're just all very supportive, even if they don't necessarily completely understand what I'm going through. If I ask for help, they'll be there. Um, and then when it comes to my relationship with my fiance now, he we've been together uh, just approaching six years. So right around the time when I got diagnosed with IH is when I met him. Um, we've done a lot of long distance. And so I think that made it a little bit tricky. Um, but that's a whole different, unique situation. Mm -hmm. More recently, though, it has been a really great thing as I get more involved in this community. We actually sat down the other night and I put out YouTube videos on, on the TV and just, you know, let's watch this together so you can kind of understand, like, do you have any questions? Um, so, but if I didn't have these people, right. and even, even though I do, sometimes I still feel lonely because, you know, mm -hmm. you're missing out on some things you really want to mm -hmm. do sometimes and that doesn't feel good, but mm -hmm. I know that they always have my back. Yeah, that's wonderful. I think social support is often sort of neglected as a really key area, isn't it, of support and yeah. well-being. And I hate that word success, but I think if, you know, we're to be set up as far as possible to sort of live fully is probably a better description than I agree the social support and not feeling isolated because you're already isolated when you have to nap and miss out, as you say. Um, well, Hayley, thank you. Um I'm really excited to keep tracking with you, actually. Every post that you put out is really meaningful and it makes me think. And uh, that's not always the case with social media, is it? Sometimes it feels like a bit of a waste <laughs> of time. But um, it's really... And we're also grateful, actually, that you're um, supporting the Hypersomnia Foundation and raising awareness. Um, so um, 
thank you for spending this time with us and sh shedding light on the intersection between occupational health and idiopathic hypersomnia. And I'm really excited actually to see, I mean, it sounds like an area that could um, hopefully down the line have some research funded research into how we can really bring the tools that you suggest as an OT into everyday life as part of the toolbox, as it were, for dealing with idiopathic hypersomnia. Thank you, Hayley. Absolutely. Thank you.